All right, can't help but be happy when you, when you play that song. Uh, good to see everybody here this morning. And before we start, I have a, have a story for you. See if you've heard this before. There was a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. And they were walking down. Have you heard that one before? I think so. If, you, if you've been around here for the last couple of weeks, you've heard that story. And so uh, uh, we're going to continue. If you're, this is your first time, wondering what in the world are they talking about? Uh, it's week three of our neighbor series, which is uh, a deep dive, in a sense, into the parable of the Good Samaritan. So we're going to continue with that. If you have your Bibles or your devices, whatever you have with you, or you can follow along with the scripture on the screen or in your handout, it's everywhere that you, uh, uh, you can find the scripture. But we're going to start with Luke chapter 10, and we're going to begin reading the story again. We'll read it every week through this series. So let's start with verse 25 says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord, your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? That famous question. So exactly who is my neighbor? Now, Pastor Chris has talked about it the last couple of weeks that that was the wrong question, the wrong question to ask. Who is my neighbor? But here's the reality. I'll bet you in small groups over the course of the last two weeks, Someone in the discussion about the Good Samaritan has said, well, exactly who is my neighbor? We all want to know the answer to that question. So why do you think that this lawyer asked the question? So, well, you know, we'll say it's the wrong question, but why do he ask it? And I think it's very simple. And unfortunately, I think it's the reason that we ask it sometimes. And that is the lawyer asked this question because he did not want to love one more person than he was obligated to love. He didn't want to feel responsible for those beyond his obligation. So if Jesus, when hearing the question, had in fact in sort of rabbinical teaching methods, had turned that question around on him. So when the lawyer said, who is my neighbor? If Jesus had said, will you tell me who is your neighbor? The lawyer wouldn't have been at a loss for words. The lawyer would have had a definitive answer as to who his neighbor was. He would have answered strictly from the law, what the law says. And he would have used a term similar to this. He would have said, those that I am bound to love. My neighbor is anyone that I am bound to love. In other words, whoever the law holds me accountable for, and tells me I should love, then that's who my neighbor is. And he would have had a clear understanding as to who that would be. If you imagine a funnel, and at the bottom it's narrow and gets wider at the top, the lawyer would have started, I I am obligated to love my immediate family. And then he would have gone further and he said, I'm also, by the law, obligated to love my extended family. And he would have gone higher. And he said, I'm also obligated by the law to love those in my village or my town. And he would have gone higher. He would have said, I'm also obligated by the law to love my tribe, my Jewish tribe. And then he would have gone one step higher and this would have been the cap. This would have been the extent of his obligation. He would have said, I am a neighbor to those of the same blood, which was their way of saying the height of my responsibility as a Jew is to love a Jew. No more. That's my responsibility. And so when Jesus hears this, you know, he obviously when he asks the question, he's going to tell a parable. When the parable, what Jesus does is blow the lid 
off the funnel and says, no, that's not the limit to who we're responsible to love. Now, Jesus would, agree to, would have agreed at the starting point, our family. We can't love, we can't care for, show compassion for, uh, for the greater community and not do the same thing for those that are in a home, right? We, we can't have all this compassion and show mercy and grace and do all these things to care for the greater community and then exclude our spouse and our children from the same care. So Jesus would have agreed with him at that point. That's where it starts. But then Jesus would have said, but that's not where it ends. According to the parable, and you can write this down, a neighbor is someone who crosses our path whose needs we have the ability to meet. Jesus would have said, no, you're not just obligated by the law and it stops with those of the same blood. But whomever crosses your path, whose needs you have the ability to meet, that's your neighbor. That's the one that we're supposed to love. Now, this doesn't mean that we're to meet everyone's needs everywhere. You notice that the good Samaritan in this story, he didn't quit his job and he didn't start searching for wounded travelers on highways all over the Roman Empire because somehow that was his responsibility. But what he did do was this. He cared for the one man who crossed his path, whose needs he had the ability to meet. And see, here's the thing about our lives. The path of our lives, we're going to come in contact with a lot of people living all kinds of lives with all kinds of stories. And if we believe as followers of Christ that our steps are ordered of the Lord, then that means that those individuals who cross our path are divine opportunities for us to be what God has called us to be, and that is to be a neighbor to that individual. That is to love them, to help them, to do what we can to minister to them. If God in his sovereign will bring someone across our path and we have the means of helping them, then Jesus says that's where the obligation is. We're supposed to be their neighbor. So if, if that's the answer to the question, then the good question that Pastor Chris has been talking about is the question, am I a neighbor? Or another way of saying, how do I become a good neighbor? And I think the answer is in the story as well. I think we can see the answer. It's illustrated in the way that the Samaritan acted toward this individual who was in need. So let's see what he did, beginning with verse 30. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But the Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, now let's stop right there, mid-verse. Let's stop at that point right there. All right, all three, priest, Levite, Samaritan, saw the same thing, but they obviously didn't see it the same way. You see, the the priest and the Levite saw the needs of the man. They saw his condition. And it's obvious that they looked at the needs of the man and then began to calculate the cost and the risk to get involved. What is this going to cost me? What is the danger to me? In fact, their behavior sort of implies that, that uh, you know, they operated from a standpoint of sort of asking themselves the question, what could happen to me if I get involved? Instead of asking, what's going to happen to this man if I don't do something, they were more interested in what's going to happen to me if I get involved with this man. And so they did the math 
They calculated the risk and they decided that it wasn't worth it. And so scripture says that they crossed to the other side of the street and they just kept on walking. It wasn't worth the risk. It wasn't worth the cost. But the Samaritan, on the other hand, seeing the very same thing, sees it a different way. He doesn't see the needs of the man, but the Samaritan saw the man that was in need. And it's different. You see, one of the genius parts of this story is that the man who fell among robbers is not identified. There's not a description given uh, as to who he was, where he was from, what country, uh, culturally who was he. Was he on, on a certain, you know, what's, you know, what status on a socioeconomic ladder was he? There's no information given about him. Now, the description is given. It says that he was stripped and he was left half dead. Now, one of the ways you could identify someone in that culture was to see what they wore. Clothing would be different for different countries. It would be different for, you know, for different geographic locations, even within a country. Certainly clothing would be different if he was poor or if he was rich. But the robbers stripped him of his clothing so they, you couldn't identify him by that. It says that he was left half dead. The implication in scripture is that he was semi or unconscious at the time. Another way to identify someone is to hear them speak. We do it all the time. We hear someone speak and we say, Yankee, (laughs) right? You know, Uh, or the other way around, you know, they hear some of us speak and they say, redneck. You know, so, you know, so, you know, we sort of pass judgment based upon what we hear. We can tell by dialect, dialect, what part of the country they come from. We can tell if they're speaking a different language that they obviously don't come from this country. They must come from another country. And again, poor rich, the rich would have spoken in a more classical way than someone on the street, someone who was poor. But that ability to identify was taken away because he was unconscious. Now, it's true that most theologians and most writers, when they talk about this story, will assume that this man was Jewish. But again, hear me, it is not stated in the text. Now, why is that important? Why would Jesus leave that detail out? Simply because it doesn't matter. It didn't matter who he was. It didn't matter poor or rich. It didn't matter. None of those things mattered. It was a man in need. Yeah, I'm afraid that some of us, if we were telling the story, we would want to include some descriptors. You know, we would want to say that the person who fell among robbers was a rich man or he was a poor man. We would want to let everyone know if he was a black man or if he was a white man. We would want to make sure people understood if he was a Republican or if he was a Democrat. We want to make sure people would understand it was a Muslim man, it was a Christian man, it was a gay man, it was a straight man. We would certainly want to know if it was an Auburn fan or a Bama fan. <laughs> we would want to know that. And the reason that we feel compelled to put those types of descriptions in concerning someone in need is simply because we're always looking to find a way to give ourselves permission to keep our distance, to turn our heads, and to walk the other way. We're always looking to give ourselves permission. Oh, I would have helped him, but. I would have intervened, but. And we always are looking for the differences. You see, those things didn't even concern the Samaritan. He wasn't interested in that. He wasn't concerned about what made him different from the injured man. He was just simply concerned about what made him the same as the injured man. You see, to be a good neighbor, you must look beyond our differences and focus on our shared humanity. You see, all that mattered to the Samaritan was that this was a man 
created by God, stamped with the very image of God upon his life, the Imago Dei that Pastor Chris talked about. That should be all that matters to us when we come in contact with those that are in need. Experts tell us that no matter where in the world you're from, no matter what country, no matter what the culture is that you grew up in, that every human being on the face of the earth have the same basic relational needs. That no matter what your religion, no matter what your status, you need acceptance and affection and appreciation, approval, attention, comfort, encouragement, respect, security, support. It doesn't matter. You pick any individual anywhere in the world. They have the same basic needs that you have. And so the important thing is this. It's much easier to love your neighbor as or like yourself, as some translations say, when I realize that they are in fact just like me. In spite of the differences, there's more that makes us the same than the differences that we think create the distance. We're all created in the image of God. We're all human beings with the same basic relational needs, but yet we want to concentrate on the differences. And the Samaritan said, doesn't matter. It's a man in need. And so he cared for him. So what did he do? Verse 33 goes on, but a Samaritan as he journeyed came to where he was, saw him and then did what? He had compassion. The Samaritan allowed himself to be moved with compassion. He allowed this to impact him. The word compassion here in the Greek comes from a root word. The Greek root word is splachnon. You say that 10 times real fast. It's splachnon. And it's an interesting word. It's the word that refers to our inner parts. In fact, it's the word that refers to our bowels. That's weird. It's about having compassion for someone, and the word that's used is your gut. It's your bowels. That doesn't seem to make sense, but yet understand it in, the, in this way. It's similar to the way that we will use the word heart. We'll say that something moved my heart or that something touched my heart. We'll see something or experience something, and we'll say that it broke my heart. And what we're talking about are emotions, emotional responses to things. Well, we all know that the heart is not the seat of our emotions. That's not where emotion comes from. The heart is simply an organ that, you know, created by God that pumps blood through our system and helps to keep us alive. And so we would say, well, if I use it in those ways, broke my heart, moved my, that we're just using it as a figure of speech. That's the same way they use the word splunk nod in this situation. What it's referring to is something when seen or experienced is gut-wrenching. That to see or experience it was like a punch in the gut. It's a figure of speech that, that represents a significant emotional reaction to someone or something. Something stirred me, shook me to my very core, to my gut. And it says, this Samaritan looked at the man and had compassion. Now, the English word compassion is, you know, is filled with information as well. The English word comes from Latin. It's, the, it's compati. The com means with, and the word pati means to suffer. So when we say, I have compassion, it means that we suffer with someone. Now, it's easy to say, oh, I'm a compassionate person. But it really means that I feel what you feel. I understand what you're going through. I, am, I will step into your pain and I will suffer with you. So compassion means to suffer with. It's, it's, 
It's similar to our word empathy. We use empathy a lot. You know, we'll say, I empathize with you. Empathy means to relate to another person, person's pain as if it were your own. To relate to their pain as if it were my pain. That means as human beings, we interact or God creates those opportunities where our paths cross with people and we come to know what they're going through and what they're facing. And empathy means on the one hand, it means that intellectually or cognitively, I understand their situation so I understand what they must be feeling. Maybe it's because you have been there before. And so you know what the, you know, you know the fear they must have. You know the discouragement they must have, the isolation they must have. But in, empathy means it, it even goes further to emotional empathy, which means I actually step into your pain. I don't just cognitively understand what you might be going through, but I actually step into your situation and I feel what you're going through. It's sort of like being in the room when someone walks in, you know, walking barefoot through a room and stubs their toe and everybody in the room cringes, even though it didn't happen to us, we still feel it, you know, and, and you know, we know what that feels like. And so to empathize means that we, we can connect with a person's pain. What's so awesome about this is that God created us with this ability to empathize and God uses that connection as a way of bringing comfort into the lives of those that are going through difficult times. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. I, I put the message translation in here because I, I love the way it states this. It says, all praise to the God and Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. Do you get the transaction that's taking place? All right, so you go through a difficult time. And we know that God will comfort us in our times of trial or difficulty. But how does God comfort us? More times than not, he comforts us by bringing someone into our pain, bringing someone into our lives who will be there with us, who will walk the journey with us, who will speak words of wisdom and encouragement to us, individuals who will lift the load in any way that they possibly can. And we get through that trial. And the way we might state it is, I went through a difficult time, but man, God comforted me. But how did he do it? He did it more times than not through someone who stepped into your life. Have you ever been there, gone through a difficult time, and God brings the right person at the right time to say the right thing, to do the right thing, and to bring you comfort and help you get through that crisis? But then it says, and once that's happened, and it says, before you know it, you've been going through a hard time, you got comforted, and then it says, and before you know it, God brings someone into your path who needs help, who's going through a trial. So what do you do? You reach back into that reservoir of all the stuff that that person poured into your life when you were going through a hard time and you poured into this person's life. You walk with them like someone walked with you. You encourage them like someone encouraged you and you help them get through that hard time. Then what happens? You both go on your way. And before you know it, Someone steps into those lives and it goes on and it's the ability that God has built into us that if we will allow it to happen and not sear our consciousness and not harden our hearts to people, but if we will allow it to help happen, we feel compassion for people and we step in to what's going on in their lives. But for this to work, we have to do more than just feel and more than just understand. You see, for this kind of compassion to work, 
It has to be acted upon. Because biblical compassion is really empathy plus action. It's not just me understanding your plight. It's not me just feeling the emotions you're feeling. For it to be biblical compassion, I have to do something about it. All through the New Testament, you read where Jesus stepped into a scene and he had compassion on people. He had compassion on a crowd, had compassion on a leper, had compassion on blind folks. Had, you know, always compassion, 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 but it doesn't stop there. The next thing it tells you what he did. He had compassion on the crowd, so he healed all their sicknesses. He had compassion on the leper, so he healed his leprosy. He had compassion on the blind, and so he, he, re, he gave them their sight. He always acted. It would not have benefited those people at all if he had just looked at them and said, man, I feel what you feel. I understand what you're going through. Hopefully I'll see you again when I come back through. What made it biblical compassion was that he acted upon the situation and did something to relieve the pressure, to relieve the pain that they were going through. And so what has the Samaritan done then? He, he, has, he saw the man, he allowed himself to be moved with compassion, and then he acted. He did what he was supposed to do. He didn't just feel. I mean, how would that have been, you know, to he spent a little more time than the priest and the Levite just looking at the man and feeling for the man, maybe a little tear run down his face, but then just say, I'm busy, I gotta go. That wouldn't have helped the man. He acted out of the compassion. Look at beginning with verse 34. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set himself on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. I want you to note, notice that in that description of what he did, there, there are multiple verbs that are used to describe his action. Five of them are actually the very same word. And it's the word for touch. And so it says he touched and he touched and he touched and he touched and he touched. And so what it's doing is painting for us the picture of an individual who got personally involved, who took action to step into and to personally help someone who's in need. It's not the description of someone who, who uh, you know, just felt compassion from a distance, but someone who got personally involved. Matter of fact, you know, look how the, the, uh, the lawyer describes the actions of the Samaritan. Verse 36, Jesus asking, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed mercy. So the actions of the Samaritan are described by this legal scholar as being acts of mercy. He acted mercifully toward the man. So that's telling us that to demonstrate his compassion, the Samaritan did something. He didn't just walk by, you know, go to the next village and say, man, I saw this dude out there. He was so beat up, he was messed up. I had so much compassion for him, but I had an appointment I had to get to. And so I had to rush on. I hope somebody found him. I hope, some, I, I hope he survived. That wouldn't have been compassion. He acted upon it. He demonstrated not just through feeling, but through action. So the question then is how are we supposed to demonstrate compassion like the Samaritan demonstrated compassion? Well, we're to act mercifully. We're to treat people in a merciful fashion. When we come into, into the lives of people who are going through hard times, we're to be merciful. What does mercy mean? Mercy is doing what you can with what you have. It's just that simple. Do what you can with what you have. So as God directs people in a divine fashion to cross our path and they have needs, 
and we have the ability to meet that need, then to be a good neighbor, we have to just do what we can with what we have. Not to be overwhelmed and think, I can't do everything, I can't fix everything, and because I can't do everything and fix everything, I just won't do anything. But just to do what you can with what you have. That was the standard that all three of these, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, are judged by in the story. Did they do what they could with what they had? You see, they, they tell us that the priest probably was riding a horse. But he would not have had oil and wine. So he would have been judged by did he do what he could with what he had, and he failed. Because he couldn't treat the wounds, but he could have put him on the horse and taken him somewhere to get help. The Levite was probably walking, but he would have had with him oil and wine. So he would have been judged not by the fact that he couldn't get him somewhere, but just by the standard, do what you can with what you have. He could have tended to the wounds, but he didn't do that. So he failed. The Samaritan, on the other hand, was able to create bandages out of something that he had. He was able to pour in wine and oil to tend to the wounds. He was able to put him on his animal. He took the time to get him to a place of safety. He took money that he had to pay for his care. And so how did he measure up to the standard? He, he, he passed because he did what he could with what he had. Now, if he had just tended to the wounds and didn't put him on his animal, the Samaritan would not be the good Samaritan. He would have failed just like the priest and just like the Levite. So it's just do what you can with what you have. When I was in college, Phyllis and I were married and, and uh, we actually had uh, one child at the time. He was two years old and we were living in the housing uh, at the school I attended uh, that was married housing. And so it was an apartment complex and all the people who lived there were married students, married, uh, some of them with children. And so we got to know each other well. We all had sort of the, you know, similar circumstances, all going through the same stuff. We were all complaining, you know, about too much homework and, too, you know, how bad our professors were and, you know, all complaining about everything. You know, so we, we had a bond, you know. So there was this couple who lived next door to us that, you know, nowadays you hear the phrase, well, they're like hippies. That's because you're not hippies anymore. You're trying to copy hippies. This couple, they were hippies. <laughs> because they, this was the early 70s. You know, grew up in the 60s. They were hippies. And so we get to talk, and so they start telling, you know, she's, going to, she's expecting a child, and they're telling us all the time how they're going to do this, that it's going to be awesome, that it's going to be all natural, he's going to be in there for the birth. Now understand, that's commonplace now. Back then, that was not commonplace. Back then, the norm was to do it God's way, and that was for the lady to get drugs and for the men to sit in a room with all the other dads and watch TV and talk sports. You know, that's the way we did it. You know, and, but, but, you know, they were going to do it. And they were so thrilled with themselves. And also, you know, it was going to be wonderful. And so I, I came home one day. And, and as I'm walking to my door, I hear this awful crying going on. And, and, and it wasn't just crying. This was like moaning. This was guttural. I mean, this was someone is suffering. And I looked and their door was partially open and oh, my heart sank. I thought, oh no, you know, hope nothing's happened to her or the baby. And so I, I get to the door and I mean, there's no getting their you know, attention knocking. So I just push the door on open and I look inside and the guy is sitting in the middle of his living room floor and just wailing. So now I'm really concerned. Something horrible has happened. And so I walk in, I go over there, and, and, and I get his attention. And I ask, what's wrong? And he starts telling me. He said, you know, my wife went into labor, and we got her to the hospital, and everything was going fine. And so I'm thinking, oh, this is about to be tragic. And he says, and then all of a sudden, the labor got really bad, and she screamed at me. 
and she told me, I hate you. <laughs> you did this to me. I don't ever want to see you again. And he said, I tried to reason with her, but she started getting so, so emotional, her blood pressure's going up. And, and, and so she starts screaming, get out of here, get out of here. And as he's going out, the nurses say, you need to step on out. And as he gets to the door uh, you know, of the labor delivery room, she screams, not just out of here, out of the hospital. <laughs> and so he goes home. And he's sitting in the middle of his living room floor, wailing and crying, you know, so dejected. And, and so I'm, you know, I have to be honest with you, when I finally got the whole story, I sort of thought it was funny. <laughs> you know, because it's like, yeah, you talked about how we did it. She never told me to get out of the room. You know, she never yelled at me. And, and so, but then I thought, what am I going to do with this? I can't just walk away from this. And I didn't know how to help him. So I did what I could do. I sat next to him in the floor and just talked to him, prayed with him, prayed for his wife, prayed for his new baby, you know, just prayed for him, prayed, you know, just prayed for everything I could think to pray about. And then I just sat and talked and I just told him every, you know, all the platitudes I could think of, everything's going to be okay. She didn't mean it. It's going to be all right. You know, you're not getting a divorce. I mean, you know, I'm just trying to encourage him. And I kept telling him that eventually they're going to call. And I don't know how long it was. It was a long time. The phone finally rang. And it was the hospital giving him the all clear. And they said, it's okay now. You can come back and you can visit your wife and you can visit your new baby daughter. So he went, he was thrilled, he was wonderful. But after that time, there was hardly an occasion that we bumped into one another, him or his wife, that they didn't want to hug me and they didn't want to thank me, you know, for you know, helping him through that crisis and getting him through that. And I, I, as I look back, I didn't do anything really. I just did what I could with what I have. And that's what being merciful is. Merciful is just, and compassion is just, fine. you know, seeing someone who has no food and giving them food. It's seeing someone who is starving for love and giving them love. It's, you know, finding someone who is lonely and giving them company. Finding someone who's discouraged and giving them encouragement. It's just do what you can with what you have. And if that's, if you're still confused about what to do. I think there's always one filter you can run everything through. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Luke chapter six, verse 31, it says this. Jesus says, and as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. And we call that the what? Golden rule. So what do you do when your paths is crossed by someone who's in need, someone who's suffering, someone who's going through a hard time. If you're not sure, just ask yourself the question, what would I want someone to do for me if I were in that situation? How would I want someone to treat me if I were in his shoes? I think... You know, it's a, it's a question as to, if we're going through difficult times, you know, what do we want people to do? do? Do you want someone who will just sympathize with you? To sympathize is really just a cleaned up way of saying what our real attitude is, and that is, man, it stinks to be you right now. It is. We, we even tell people that. They'll tell us what's going on, we'll say, Oh man, I sympathize with you, but I would hate to be in your shoes right now. Way to help. You know, you're, all you're saying to individuals is, man, it stinks to be you right now. So is that what you want, someone to sympathize? You say, no, I want someone to empathize, but understand, 
To empathize means, yes, they may understand your pain, and yes, they may feel emotionally what you're going through because of a kindred connection, because of a similar experience they've had. But the reality is that someone can feel that way. They can even shed some tears, but they can still just walk on by. Is that what you want if you were the one in need? Or would you want someone like the Good Samaritan who at all costs and at all risk just steps in and acts and does what they can with what they have? I think all of us would say, if I were the one in need, I would want someone to care enough to act on my behalf. So then the challenge for us is, are we acting that way towards the people who God brings into our life who are going through tough times? So my prayer for us is that God would help us to remove the blinders and to see the people around us not just their needs, but to see them. To not allow ourselves to be distracted by whatever the differences may be between us, but to look past all that and to see them for who they are, that they are individuals created in the image of God. That God would help us to allow ourselves to be moved by compassion. To combat the tendency to be desensitized and to harden our hearts to the world around us, but allow ourselves to be moved with compassion and then to have the courage to act, to do something about it. As simple as just speaking a word of encouragement, just saying, I'm here with you. Whatever it is, just do what you can. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word and thank you for the challenge that it brings into our lives. And I pray, God, that you would help us. God, not just to look at this story and then just say, man, that's a good story. But, Father, to understand that we are challenged by this. To not just to emulate the Good Samaritan, but in fact to emulate Christ, which is the ultimate example of the good neighbor. So, Father, help us to take every opportunity you give us to see them as divine appointments, and then God, to do everything we can with what we have. In Jesus' name, amen.